Hey everybody, Brian Allred, teaching pastor at New Life Presbyterian Church in your town. Welcome back to our series on learning to love Leviticus, where today we're going to be entering into a couple new chapters in this section on instructions for holiness. Um, as you remember, we are taking a three-step approach to learning to love this book of Leviticus. We began with understanding the context of Leviticus, both the literary and the redemptive context of where we find the book of Leviticus in the scriptures and its unfolding revelation of God's redemptive plan. Uh, and then the second step was looking at the uh, actual content in the 27 chapters in the book. So we're going to be looking at chapters 21 and 22 uh, today in these instructions for holiness, which we could basically entitle instructions for priests and their offerings. We could break this into uh, three points here uh, covering these two chapters. Regulations for the priests. We see this in chapter 21, the first 15 verses. Uh, what um, qualifies the priests and keeps them qualified uh, to continue to perform their functions. Uh, in the second point, regulations for offering the sacrifices, uh, something very similar to that first point, but some additional regulations for the priests that we see uh, for their fitness to offer the sacrifices of the people. That begins in chapter uh, 21, verse 16, and goes all the way to verse 16 of chapter 22. And then uh, chapter 22 concludes with um, reviewing some of the regulations for the sacrifices. The sacrifices had to be without blemish. We've read uh, quite a bit about that in the first seven chapters of Leviticus, but that's repeated here um, in this context of Leviticus chapters 21 and 22. And so let's begin by looking at the regulations for the priests in those first 15 verses. And that's actually broken up into regulations for um, the ordinary priests and then also for the high priest. But before we get to that uh, content, we need to remember that Israel's priests uh, served as officers um, before the people uh, with specific responsibilities that the rest of the people uh, didn't have. And so they were to serve uh, as leaders of the people and as such as examples to the people in their commitment to holiness. And we're going to see that uh, as we walk through these chapters. This commitment to holiness uh, finds a very concrete expression in their burying and in their marrying. In other words, how they uh, grieve losses um, and deal with the dead, uh, but also in their choices of marriage, uh, which are very regulated by the Lord. Um, those set apart for special service, as the priests were, were not to be defiled by mourning for the dead or by entering prohibited marriages. Uh, we're going to see in the second point also that they could potentially be disqualified by uh, certain physical defects uh, because a perfect or a whole priest or mediator is required. More on that as we go forward. Uh, and then the last thing before we get into these specific regulations for the priests, the people did have some role in assisting the priests in fulfilling this holy calling. Um, if you look at verse uh, 8, actually, it talks about how the people are to regard the priest as holy and set apart by the Lord. Not, in other words, they're to recognize the uniqueness and the importance of this official role that the priests serve. We see something actually similar in the New Testament uh, in chapter uh, 13 of Hebrews, where it calls the people to obey their leaders, uh, as those who have been uh, charged with overseeing their souls or caring for their souls. And then the author of Hebrews reminds the people that um, they want to, they, they should allow their leaders to do this with joy and not with groaning, because if they did it with groaning, it would be of no benefit to them. And so they shouldn't, the people should not add to the burdens of their leaders. And uh, there's something reflected of that uh, in Hebrews that we see here also uh, in the instructions given to the people regarding uh, their priests in verse 8 here in chapter 21. Uh, but when we look at um, the regulations for the ordinary priests in the first nine verses of uh, Leviticus chapter 21, we see that one of the things that um, one of the regulations that was put in place was that they could not defile themselves with the dead. Uh, remember that uh, coming in contact with the dead would render them unclean, and as priests, that would certainly inhibit or impair their ability to carry out their duties and responsibilities. Uh, so they were not to defile themselves with the dead, unless uh, those who passed away were immediate family members. And this is what we're seeing in verses 1 through 6. And what we, what we seem to see there in those verses is that they were not to defile themselves with the dead um, or, or enter into this undue mourning uh, for those who were not related to them uh, by blood. And so uh, blood relations, close blood relations, uh, they could uh, enter into mourning and defile themselves um, without guilt um, because of the closeness of those ties. But uh, outside of those close blood ties, they were not to uh, enter into that kind of mourning or to defile, defile themselves 
for the dead. Now, there is a kind of a question here because they're not related to their wives by blood, actually. And so commentators actually differ as to whether uh, wives uh, were included uh, as an exception to this list in uh, verses 1 through 6. Some say they were, some say they weren't. So uh, it's difficult to definitively say one way or the other. They are not specifically listed, uh, by the way, uh, in those first six verses as an exception. But, you know, you kind of think about why would there be this restriction? And, and again, part of it is that uh, the grief of the covenant people is to be expressed in a way that exhibits the hope of the covenant that the Lord has made with Israel, a covenant really of life, a uh, life that is stronger than death. Um, so again, you know, we, we saw a parallel uh, in Hebrews about uh, recognizing leaders and not hindering their work or making their work harder. Um, just as the people of Israel were to do in recognizing the holiness of the priesthood and their, um, their being set apart for specific functions. We also see a parallel here about uh, our grief as the covenant people, not specifically related to leaders or to priests, certainly in the New Testament, but actually given to all the people. At the end of um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we're reminded that we are not to grieve like the rest of the world grieves, who has no hope, but we are to grieve in a way that's consistent with the gospel. Our grief is very deep. Our grief is very real, but it is not without hope because of the covenant of life and the promise that we have through the gospel and the resurrection of Jesus. And so that that, that tempers our grief in a very important way. It distinguishes our grief in an important way because we grieve in hope. And the priests were to exemplify and model this before the people. And so that explains these uh, regulations, or at least this first regulation about not defiling themselves um, uh, and becoming unclean for the dead. Second thing, remember I said it had to do with burying and marrying. And so the second regulation has to do with marrying. They could not marry a woman who had been with um, other men illegitimately. The ESV translates it uh, being defiled. Um, couldn't marry a woman who had been defiled. Um, so really just illegitimate sexual relationships, um, whether those were uh, consensual or even not consensual. They were not to enter into those relationships uh, with those women or women who had been divorced. And uh, same thing might come up with this regulation as came up with the other one. Why would there be this kind of restriction? Well, remember that um, the, the Levites and the priests uh, were identified by lineage. They weren't voted into that office. Uh, they were born into that office uh, by virtue of being in the line of the Levites. And so regulating who priests were permitted to marry preserved the purity of the Levitical line, and we're going to see it does the same thing for the priestly line. Um, these regulations would squelch doubts about the paternity of priests and high priests um, because they, they weren't marrying women who had been with other men who may not have been Levitical. And so it, it, it remains the, uh, it keeps in line the, um, uh, the Levitical line. So, um, in verse 9, there's this comment about um, a daughter of a priest uh, who was uh, probably the interpretation of whoring there is the line that's used, uh, is a reference to prostitution. But um, the daughter of a priest becoming a prostitute was strictly forbidden. She was actually to be executed, it would seem, from the language of, of being uh, put to the fire in verse 9. Uh, because, again, of the disregard of the purity of that Levitical line and the lineage of which that Levitical priesthood continues to move forward. Now, when we get to the regulations for the high priests in verses 10 through 15 of chapter 21, we encounter even stricter regulations for the dead. Um, one could likely interpret the restrictions uh, placed on the high priest for mourning as they were not to enter into mourning at all for, for any uh, of um, the deceased among them and or to make themselves unclean for any reason. Uh, with the dead. Even those close family members that we saw for ordinary priests uh, are off limits for the high priest. And the high priest also has stricter marriage restrictions. Um, not only were they not to marry someone who had been defiled or who had been divorced, but they couldn't marry a widow either. For the same kind of reasons, you can have counter claims to who the next in line to serve as the high priest would be because it's determined by lineage. Uh, and if you think about the intermixing of these kinds of relationships, marrying somebody who, who already has other children, and then those children become claimants to the throne because they're stepchildren of so-and-so. If you're wondering how convoluted and messy that can become, just study, I mean, just for one example, 
study um, the monarchy in England in the 15 and 1600s and the various claimants to the throne that um, were involved in that. It, it became very, very messy. And um, one of the ways, probably the best way to understand these marital restrictions placed upon the priests and the high priest is to avoid those kinds of counterclaims uh, and messiness in terms of claiming um, um, legitimate warrant to occupy the position of high priest based on um, various marriages that had occurred. So that's off limits for the high priest to avoid that kind of confusion. Okay, so so much for regulations for the priests. We go into regulations for offering sacrifices uh, in uh, verse 16, beginning in verse 16 of chapter 21 and extending all the way to verse 16 of chapter 22. Um, so even if a priest um, met the qualifications in terms of uh, not de being defiled for the dead and not marrying outside of those restrictions, that wouldn't necessarily qualify the priest still to provide offerings Okay, so this is all about uh, performing the official duties of offering the sacrifices in the holy place here, that there were some other regulations that govern that. One of those is that no physical defects were to be um, found in any officiating priest. Uh, this is in verses 18 through 20. Now, they could do other priestly service, but they couldn't offer sacrifices in the holy place. So uh, they could prepare the bread for the holy place, place it on the table. They could light the lamp that was in the holy place. They could um, likely offer incense on the altar of incense in the holy place, but they could not actually offer the sacrifices that the people of Israel brought to them uh, in the courtyard if these physical defects were, um, were applicable to the person. Uh, the list of defects corresponds to what disqualified animals for sacrifice in chapter 22, verses 22 through 14. So remember, we're going to look at regulations for the sacrifices themselves next. But 12 defects are listed um, that would disqualify a priest, and 12 defects are listed that would disqualify an animal as well. So there's a parallel here. We'll get to the significance of that in a second. But here are the defect, defects that are listed in, in Leviticus chapter 21. We find them in verses 18 through 20. That no one who has a blemish shall draw near. Again, that's, that's this priestly drawing near to the Lord dwelling in the tabernacle. And then it lists these blemishes. A man blind or lame, or one who has a mutilated face, or a limb too long, or a man who has an injured foot or an injured hand, or a hunchback or a dwarf, or a man with a defect in his sight, or an itching disease, or scabs, or crushed testicles. Um, that last one generally raises a, a number of questions. It's surprising that that's in there. And I actually had somebody put me on the spot once and just said, you had 10 minutes to prepare for a sermon about um, a priest not being able to serve if um, he had crushed testicles. What would the sermon be on? Uh, so this is a side note here, just to comment a little bit on this. Uh, why would that disqualify somebody? Well, very quickly, if you're confused about that, just think about how the priest was to be an instrument of life, uh, a vessel of life uh, for the people under the covenant uh, in the Old Testament. And um, crushed testicles would indicate someone who was not a life giver in a biological sense, and that would reflect something inconsistent or disordered with that um, spiritual kind of life-giving function that the priest had. And so uh, that's likely the explanation uh, there, that the priest was to be an embodiment of a mediator who uh, brought people and represented people before a God of life. And so he himself had to uh, embody this kind of life-giving um, aura, if you will. And again, now this is, this is a, a, a more of a portrait of the greater mediator and our great high priest, Christ Jesus, who obviously is the fulfillment of that life-giving mediator. Um, who um, by his, by the work of his resurrection, the pouring out of his spirit, uh, brings uh, new life to his children who are adopted into the family of God. And so anyway, I hope that, I hope that makes sense. Just wanted to, to kind of take a, 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 tan, a brief tangent there to explain a little bit about, about that. But, but even if that one doesn't cause some questions in your mind, the, the, the whole kind of uh, restriction 
placed upon priests having these physical defects might raise questions. This sounds really discriminatory and cruel today to modern ears. Uh, it's very um, politically incorrect, if you will, to, to think about these things disqualifying somebody. There's no mention of actually character traits disqualifying the priest, although that's not necessarily true. Um, it's not mentioned here, but other character flaws would eliminate people from serving in the priesthood. Remember that Eli's sons were wicked sons, and they were put to death by the Lord himself because of their conduct. Uh, but yeah, here with these restrictions for those capable of fulfilling their official responsibilities as priests and offering sacrifices, there's no character flaw mentioned here. Um, some of these um, defects may actually be genetic, and there's no, there's no forgiveness of that. There's no lifting of that. There seems to be a very rigid expectation of the physical wholeness of the priests that can cause questions. But basically, here's the principle. Both the priest and the offering, we're going to see that in a second, but both the priest and the offering had to be without blemish according to the standards of the Old Testament. Uh, if people were to draw near to the Lord and find acceptance of this holy, righteous God who is dwelling in their midst, represented by this tabernacle in their midst, then those who would draw near must come through a mediator, and they must draw near through a perfect sacrifice, and that mediator himself must be without blemish. And we say this is the regulations under the Old Testament uh, priesthood and under the Old Covenant, but as we've been talking about, the, the underlying principle has not changed. We always think, well, that's Old Testament stuff. It's irrelevant anymore. It's not applicable. It is applicable, but it's fulfilled. We're able to draw near now because we have a priest and offering who is without blemish and who is eternal. Um, this is the argument of the book of Hebrews. He's a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek, and he's offered a perfect sacrifice, and he himself is a perfect mediator offering himself as that sacrifice. And so uh, we see that principle embedded here or and, um, revealed here in the Old Testament, but we see it fulfilled in the person and ministry of Jesus, which remember, that's the third point of learning to live Leviticus, and that's understand the completion, how all these things are pointing forward uh, to Jesus. So Jesus, by the way, no defects. Uh, he is a lamb without spot or blemish. Uh, a couple of other things to note here about regulations for offering sacrifices. The priests could not be unclean uh, if they were to eat the sacrificial food. Here the emphasis is not so much on offering the sacrifices the people bring, but actually um, enjoying those sacrifices that were given to the priests. Remember, if you go back to some of the early chapters in Leviticus, some of the offerings that the people brought, portions of those offerings were given to the priests for their food. Um, but no unclean person would be able to eat this sacrificial food. Again, you can go back to chapter 3 with the peace offerings, verse 11, verse 16. Um, and this just reminds us that the priest is not above the law. Uh, the priest is also subject to God's regulations for cleanliness, just like, for cleanness, just like everyone else would be. Uh, second thing mentioned kind of here under regulations for offering sacrifices related to um, uncleanness and eating uh, the holy things was that no lay person was to eat of the holy offering. So, they were given to the priests, and the priests had to be clean in order to eat them, and no lay person was to eat them at any point in time. Even a clean lay person was not to, to eat of the holy things that were given to the priests. However, somebody might make a mistake, eat something they weren't supposed to make. Uh, if that were the case, they were required to bring a reparation offering. Um, so there is grace for um, accidentally, unintentionally consuming something that was meant for a priest. We read that in verses 14 and 15 of the chapter. Um, and of course, one thing to note here when we think about these regulations for offering sacrifices, the qualifications for special service, uh, think of the officers of elder or deacon in the New Testament church today, are no longer based on lineage because the church is now open to uh, the Gentiles. Um, and so these qualifications now are clearly based on character rather than lineage. Uh, we can look at something like 1 Timothy 3 for the qualifications of elders and deacons. And we see there uh, not any kind of lineage whatsoever, but rather uh, character traits. Uh, one last thing to, to note here, regulations for the sacrifices, verses 17 through 33 of chapter 22. Perfect animals were required. Uh, they could not be less than eight days old. Uh, we read a lot about that earlier in the book of Leviticus, first seven chapters about uh, the sacrifices, uh, how they had to be uh, without blemish. And so this is reiterated here uh, for the priests in chapter 22. 
Uh, also added to here, I don't think we read this earlier, they can't offer an animal on the same day as its mother. Um, that might have something to do with depleting the number of sacrifices, although the, if you could offer, um, if you could offer a, a sacrifice two days later than offering uh, its mother, that, that would still seem to, to lead to a possible depleting of uh, available sacrifices. So it's unclear as to exactly why this regulation is there, uh, but it is explicitly stated here in these verses not to offer an animal on the same day as its mother. Um, but connected to the regulations for an unblemished sacrifice, remember a perfect unblemished sacrifice is foundational to the Christian faith. It's foundational. Um, again, it's fulfilled in Jesus, but that principle is laid down here in the book of Leviticus. Another thing to keep in mind, I think this is brought out in Alan Ross's commentary on Leviticus, that the only blemished offering that is acceptable to God that we are permitted to bring is ourselves. Uh, a broken and contrite heart um, God will not despise. We read that in Psalm 51. However, keep in mind that we bring this broken, blemished offering of ourselves by faith in the work and perfect sacrifice of Christ Jesus, knowing that we are accepted before the Father through his perfect offering of himself, not in our own righteousness or our own unblemishedness. We are only found unblemished and righteous in Christ Jesus, our high priest and our sacrifice. So just some concluding thoughts here uh, about chapters 21 and 22. Those called by the Lord are to um, exemplify holiness and model before others and the world that faith uh, that they have in the word of the Lord. Uh, and this is true especially of leaders. Um, leaders must, in a, in a very particular way, exemplify holiness and model faith uh, before others. Derek Tidball puts it this way in his commentary, effective leaders, I keep having to move my face around here, effective leaders will put God above all else, including personal convenience, the dictates of feeling, and the desire to be fashionable. Committed leaders will strive for holiness. Wise leaders will care for their bodies as temples of the Holy Spirit. Skillful leaders will shun mediocrity and perform all their duties with excellence. And dedicated leaders will watch with special temptations, will watch the special temptations and occupational hazards in dealing regularly with holy things. In other, wise, in other words, they're not to become casual because of familiarity in dealing with holy things. And so Tidball just kind of commenting on this, these uh, these regulations for priests in uh, Leviticus chapter 21 and 22 and applying them to just the importance of what effective leadership looks like, committed leadership looks like. And so some very wise words there, but we have to remember that these kinds of things all Christians are called to, uh, particularly because in the New Testament, all God's people constitute a royal priesthood. Uh, this is exactly what, what uh, Peter writes in his first epistle. You are a holy nation, a royal priesthood. And so all of us are called to live a life wholly consecrated to the Lord. Um, and so we give ourselves to the Lord just as these priests do. Uh, but even as we are called to uh, be exemplary in our, in our lives, in our pursuit of holiness, our ultimate hope is not in ourselves. Our ultimate hope is not in the leaders that we have, or at least the earthly leaders that we have. Our hope is ultimately in the priesthood of Jesus who is both the perfect priest and the perfect sacrifice and our faithful leader. We've touched on all those things already. And we lead best and we influence others best when we rest in him and his finished work and when we point to him as our sure foundation. This quote I love by C.S. Lewis who writes, Never, never pin your whole faith on any human being, not if he is the best and wisest in the whole world. There are lots of nice things you can do with sand, but do not try building a house on it. Um, but there is a solid foundation upon which we can build for uh, an eternal future, and that is on the foundation of the person and work of Jesus, our perfect sacrifice, and our great high priest. So that concludes uh, our lesson on Leviticus chapter 21 and 22. We're going to move forward into chapter 23, which gives uh, instructions for the feasts and festivals that were prescribed for the Israelites by the Lord. Leviticus chapter 23. So we're going to look at that next time. Come back. Hopefully you'll join us for that. See you later.